Okay, welcome to the, the Sports Coffee. Um, thank you to our sponsors, uh, InsureWise, uh, the, Peter, the Peterborough-based uh, brokers, brokers for any insurance needs. Today we're doing a similar to, to our, our episodes with Franny Green and, and Gerald Little. We're doing a question and answer with an ex Aston Villa, Stoke, Peterborough United, Southend United, Scunthorpe United striker, um, who, who made over 400 appearances um, in his career and over 100 goals. So had a really good career. Uh, Martin Crivers, how are you? Very well, thanks. Yeah, delighted to be on the show. I've watched the last two episodes with, with Gerard and, and Franny Green. So yeah, oh, I've got some work to, to do to <laughs> perform as well as them. So yeah, like I say, we, we put it out on uh, our our social media platforms and we got over 20 questions so what we'll do we'll go through the questions hopefully they're not too taxing and, and not too <laughs> um to the two of the same but we'll we'll go for, go from the start there's a few who've left their names so some have just put questions on so um the first the first question that has come up was um and it's a peter fan from ian simmons is the best goal that you scored when you're at posh to be honest, it, there's two or three, but I think my my personal favourite, um, I think I'd gone about four or five goals with that game. It was when I was up top with with Jimmy Quinn when we had that really good partnership and I was struggling to to get some goals. And I think we were playing Colchester at home, which was a bit of a, a local derby. Um, and I remember getting up, picking up in, in our 20 yards into our own half and just, I don't score many from outside the box. Franny Green will tell you this. And um, I went on an amazing run. I, I think I beat about four or five defenders and then just curled one bottom corner. So, yeah, uh, I think that's definitely got to be my uh, best goal. Out. And we won the game as well, so even better. Was it, yeah, always a good one. Um, so you, you mentioned Jimmy Jimmy Quinn. Uh, it's another another question from Ian. So he, he sent two in. He said, did you learn a lot from Jimmy Quinn? Oh, unbelievable. He, he was uh, phenomenal. Not just only his... He's talking, he's, he's all round game, he's old up play, his ability to, to um, improve your confidence. When I was going through a bad spell, you know, he'd always be there to, to pick you up, keep going, don't worry, don't worry about missing chances. And that's why he went on to become a, a, a really good manager. But he, he, was a, he was a great guy, but, you know, what a player. And in terms of finishing as well, you know, left foot, right foot, headers, movement, you know, it was a joy to watch and, you know, um, certainly I, I've picked up lots of tips, um, certainly, you know, that I can pass on to players from from Big Jimmy. Oh, brilliant, thank you. So next question is from Carl Amb Ambler, is if you could choose any posh player to play with past or present, so it might be, you might have answered already, who would who would it be and why? So I don't know if you, you obviously will keep a tabs on the team since you've left Peterborough and, and the players. Yeah, I, I, I keep tabs on all my X teams. I know there's a few, mm. but um, for me, I, I know there's been some really, really good players. Obviously, we, you talk about the players that, that left for, for big money. Matthew Everington, Simon Davis. Um, I can't remember the two lads that went to, to Sheffield Wednesday when I first signed. Um, and, and obviously, the current players now, there's some top, top players. But mm. me personally, my my personal favourite was when I was at Peterborough was um, a lad called Derek Payne. Unbelievable uh, midfield player. I uh, could never get near him in, in training. Wand of the left foot, great banter. And he supplied so many chances and, and goals for me. He, he reminded me of uh, um, uh, when I was at Villa, I, I had Gordon Cowens, who you know created a lot of chances for me then. And, and he, he was exactly the same. He would point and tell me where I had to run. And I'd make no runs. He'd put me through on goal and, and I'd score. So it's got to be um, Derek Payne. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's good. I, I would I would guess that some people might not have, have, have thought of that one. So that's, that's a great answer. Thank you. Um, so the next one is Elliot Simpson. Uh, if you could have one modern modern luxury that the top players of today had when you were when you were playing, what would it be? What what would it be? Well, mm. to be honest, just the, the the proper advice on diet and, and nutrition. You know, in at my age now, my body's better now than when I was eighteen. I eat better now, you know, than than when I was playing professionally. You know, I don't eat chocolate, well, I do really. You know, um, I very rarely eat fats. You know, very few carbs. 
you know, my body looks looks good and I, I, I'm really fit. And it will just be to have that, to have had that knowledge back then and, and, and utilised it certainly would have, you know, improved my performances, prolonged my career. Even though, I, you know, I finished when I was 34 and had a, a really good career, you know, I cringe and I look back at, you know, the talent that I wasted that I could have played higher and, and for longer just by eating and drinking better, just by drinking fluids and, and water and rehydrating and stretching after games. It was just... You know, it, uh, it's, it's embarrassing how the, the, the culture was way back then. Yeah, brilliant. That's a great answer. Um, Ash, Ash Brown, again, it's a Peter, a, a Peter one. He said, best and worst memories in a Peterborough shirt. Best and worst memories. <laughs> oh, that's, that, that, that's a good one. <laughs> um, I'd have to say my, um, my best memory would be uh, probably... Scoring two against Burnley um, at home. They were top of the table. Um, and one of my ex-teammates at, at, at Villa, Adrian Heath, was, was the manager at the time. Uh, and there was a lad, uh, Nigel Glegor, who was an ex-teammate at, at Stoke as well. They were top of the table. And they ended up winning the league, I think, getting promoted anyway. Um, and we were struggling at the time. And, and to beat them and score two and, and get man of the match, I think that's certainly... Um, one of my best moments. But the worst moment for me, uh, I've been thinking about this earlier, and for me, it has to be the disappointment. We had, um, we drew Walsall in the second round of the FA Cup and the game got postponed and, and the, the third round draw was made and the winners got Man United away at, um, at Old Trafford. Mm. So uh, at the time, the chairman, Peter Boyzo, you know, he told Baz that, you know, all the lads would, you know, we'd get a trip to, to Barbados if we just by winning that game and getting the the, the game at Old Trafford and obviously the, the prestige of, of playing there. And we ended up losing at home one nil. So I can't remember being as disappointed as, as a game, you know, with such magnitude and we performed so badly. I think the pressure got to all of us and, and obviously Walsall went on and uh, won the game. OK, no, um, yeah, that must, that must have been a gutter, to be fair. Absolutely um, gutter, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Andy is put. Why do you, why do you think players do not respect referees like they do in rugby? That's a general a general question. Firstly, um, no disrespect to footballers and myself who come from the ghetto and we're classed as the lower class. But a lot of rugby players are middle class or upper class pe people who have actually been brought up with you know, probably more respect and you know, a better choice of words and a, and a better vocabulary. And I think if it's inbred in you, you know, growing up and, and, and through school to respect, you know, referees, then, you know, it stands you in good stead for the, the rest of your life. And, you know, even me personally, as a manager, you know, the times I've, I've spoke out against referees and, and, and it's frustrating to see why, because, you know, a lot of referees within football will not talk to you. And I, I know that's the case in, in, in rugby. You know, they, they'll, they'll speak to them before the game. They'll speak back to the players with respect. And I think it's a mutual it's a mutual thing. But, you know, even with VAR, some of the stuff that's going on in the Premier League now is, is mind-boggling. So to expect, you know, players and managers not to, you know, question decisions or, or, or lose their mental focus due to poor refereeing decisions is, is so, so difficult. So, you know, I, I've certainly been there and I, I know how difficult it is. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a fair comment. You know, it's especially in the top the top level, like you say in the VAR, there's a lot at stake, isn't there? So managers are under immense pressure just for a goal, or you know, could change, you know, could change a game and change, you know, where they end up in the league and monetary effects to that, isn't yeah. it, to the club? So relegation or promotion, it's it's a lot of money. No, definitely. Um, another one. This one from Brock. Uh, it says, "What are what are your fondest memories of being a professional footballer?" My fondest, fondest memories are, oh, you know what, some of the, the grounds that I've played at, some of the atmospheres, you know, I've been lucky enough to, to, to play at Old Trafford, Villa Park, White Hart Lane, Anfield, St. James's Park, Ellen Road, um, Highbury, you know, some of the top stadiums with, with, full, with full capacities, you know, and, and the chill that makes your ears stand up on the back of your neck to have those experiences but it, you know even playing 
you know, lower down in the leagues, you know, when you when you've scored a goal and the fans, the the adulation, the, the, there's nothing better, you know, and the, the football lifestyle, you know, just in terms of the the banter, you meet so many good people, so many friends, and like you say, it's just a fantastic lifestyle, and it's just certainly one that I know I didn't appreciate when I was playing, and and I, you know. I'm sure that there'll be footballers there now that that take it for granted. But I would say don't ever take it for granted. You know, um, when you look at the stats that how many players that don't actually make it to professional football, you look back and then it's only now that I'm starting to come to terms with it and actually realising, you know, what a great achievement it was, you know, and how proud I, I should feel. Yeah, no, no, definitely. Um, so the next one is from Kian. It is, what was your favourite strike partner to play with across your career? Favourite strike partner across my career? Oh, wow. <laughs> Again, that is, is difficult. In terms of goals and a proper partnership, then I, I, it would be a toss-up between Jimmy Quinn and Steve Torpy. They was probably most of my two pr most productive um, goal-scoring you know, seasons. I think I got 23 with Posh that season with Jimmy, and I think I got 26 with, with Torps um, a couple of seasons at, at Scunthorpe. So... Yeah, both big men who, you know, I know I can win headers and, and lead myself, but, you know, they were players who could hold up the ball, flip the ball on and, and great, a great um, uh, sort of uh, connection, you know, where they would know where, where I would be and I'd know where they would be. So, yeah, I, I'd have to split Torps and, and Quinny. So on, on that, I'm just going to add a question to you on that question. Um, did you have... Did you have to have a good relationship off the field to have a good relationship and scoring goals on the field? Is that something, or is that just a myth? No, you know, you you know what? I, I always got well, really well with with talks, but it was really quiet. It was a family man, um, very very quiet, um, and no, it's, it's it's not important at all. And I'll always go back to the Andy Cole, Teddy Sheringham scenario. You know, they didn't like each other off the pitch, but on the pitch, you know, once you once you cross that white line, you've got to be the ultimate professional and. Yeah. You know, I, to be honest, I've got on with most people throughout my career. You know, I've got that type of personality. But, you know, um, although me and Torps were best of mates off the field, on the field, we, we clicked and um, you know, we sort of had that telepathic um, communication. OK. Um, so this is from our, our actual sponsors in Shorewise. Um, which manager did you enjoy playing under during your career the most? Which manager did I enjoy? enjoy playing under um i would have to say I, i'm one of those players who, who, who was never pally pally with a, a manager i always seem to dislike managers <laughs> for some reason it's probably because they always dropped me or, or got rid of me when they found me out um i i, I would say um honestly i, I love playing for alan little um, when i was at I had a loan spell at york and uh, at south end just in terms of his the way he dealt with with players, the way he spoke to you, um, his tactical his tactical knowledge, you know, and I, and I remember my time at South End. We had a really good side, and, and we really let him down, and and you know we cost him a sack. And I, I you know I think you know we had a team capable of, of challenging promotion. You know the season he got sacked, and I, we really let him down. And I just loved everything about him: his training methods, his mannerisms, his man management. He, he was top draw, yeah. Okay, no, right, brilliant. Um, which, and this is a current one really, which which current England under-21 player excites you the most? Current England under-21 player? Um, and that's from Charlie, didn't give a name, just Charlie. You know what, I'm struggling to, to think of any, if I'm honest, I, I don't really know a lot of England under-21. Throw, throw a few at me. Um, so I would say probably, I know Bellingham's, I guess Bellingham and is in the, the main squad. Um, trying to think of Sancho. He's not in the squad. He's not in the main squad, is he? Oh, um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You're talking about players like that, aren't you? Jaden Sancho, yeah, yeah. Jude Bellingham, yeah. Um, I, I would say any of those under 21 players that are playing in the Premier League are, are, are going to be exciting, but um, due to my lack of knowledge on <laughs> England under 21 squad, I'm sorry. I apologise for that. No, that's fine. Um, next one is. Do you have a, a favourite Barry Fry story from Mace? Yeah. Um, that you're allowed to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm allowed to say it. And, and 
uh, I'll say it, you know, I remember the, the, the day that I signed for, for Posh, you know, really excited, uh, you know, um, Chris Turner had tried to sign me a couple of seasons before that. And, you know, we'd had conversations, it never quite happened. So, you know, I, I was buzzing to finally, you know, get the move over the line. So driving to training, got to the training ground, um, she never met the lads, etc. I know a few of the players anyway, so gone in and, you know, they're all giving me some sticks saying, you know, what's going off? I'm like, what are you talking about? We're saying, well, basically, you know, Baz has just sacked uh, Mick Olsall and Lil Fuchillo. You're like, what? So sacked our two coaches to fund your transfer. So basically, they're, <laughs> you know, they're saying, you're saying you've got, you've got the assistant manager and the, the main co- first team coach the sack. So nobody knew what was going on. So we just sat there. Baz has not, not turned up, et cetera. Anyway, Baz turned up about half, half 11 to take training. And uh, so he's coming, he's introduced me to the, to the players, et cetera. And he's like, right, spoke about, you know, the, the, the struggle that we're lacking goals, we couldn't score goals. So he's put the training session on. So the session was that we got the ball on the um, opposite goal line, dribbled to Baz, who was still on the halfway line. He laid it off. He said he didn't want any goalkeepers because he wanted to improve our confidence. And then we would run through to the goal and finish. Yeah. So I'm in the queue. There's about 12, 13 players in front of me. Off they go. By the time it gets to me, not one player had scored. <laughs> so players are going through, missing open goals with no keepers. Baz is <laughs> doing his nut. Anyway, I've gone. He's like, new new signing, blah, 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 show him how it's done. I've gone through, blasted it over the bar, he stopped the <laughs> session, gone mad at everybody. I'm like, oh no, what, what's going on? What have I joined? But yeah, that was just like, just that was just Baz, he'd do crazy things. He signed me, sacked the two coaches and, you know, obviously he's, he's not a coach, he's just a great manager and, but obviously he took the session that day and uh, yeah. it didn't go too well. <laughs> Great, uh, excellent story. Um, the next one is, uh, what advice would you give to academy players now um, to, to try and make the grades? And that's from Barb's. Me, I would say to any academy player, you know, your, your future life can wait. Dedicate your life to football, your, your eating, your diet. Forget about girls, forget about partying, you know, Make sure you're, you're, you're the strongest, you're, you're the fittest. You know, make sure you're, you're, you're completing your education. Look at what you're going to do next as a, as a backup, as a backup plan, because we, we know the failure rate is, is so high. But for me, it's that total dedication. Eat, drink, sleep, football, because one move will set you and your family up for life. And there's, there's so much at stake, there's so little, you know, to... To give back, you know, and there's, there's that few players that, that get that opportunity to even make the grade, grab it with both hands. And like I said to you, put in, you know, your life on hold for three, four years and all the outside influences and the peer pressures and the social media, forget it. Focus on football. That's your only focus. Dedicate that and you'll get the rewards. No, that's great advice. Thank you. Okay, next question is from, a, I think it's an ex-teammate, Dean Hooper. Yes, Oops, yes. Yeah. No Oops um, well. He's put, can you explain your nickname? Can I explain my nickname? Yes, <laughs> I can certainly explain my nickname. Um, another great character at, at Posh when I was there was, uh, was Adrian Boothroyd. And um, I can remember coming out of the shower one day and, and Boothy had just had to um, start wearing glasses. So he, he just got these geeky new glasses or whatever. So me thinking I was funny, you know, I'll get some banter out of it. So anyway, I've got a white towel around me, put his glasses on thinking, you know, I'm going to crack the jokes. All the, lad- all the lads were laughing, etc. And he was like, you look like Mahatma Gandhi. And I'm like, what? <laughs> He's like, that's it, Mahatma Gandhi. That's your name now. And I hated it, hated it. So all the lads jumped on the bandwagon and, and that was my name. And it stuck like glue. And I remember when I left Peterborough to sign for Darlington, I thought, right, that's it got rid of this now, happy days. As soon as I walked in the dressing room, one of the lads was like, all right, Gandhi. I'm like, no, <laughs> but you know what? Since since I uh, went to Darlington, that is it. Even, you know, I hate 
I hate my name, Martin. Everybody calls me Gandhi now, and it, it's stuck like mud, and, and I love it. So thanks, Boovy, and thanks, Suits, for that. Cheers, me. <laughs> thanks. No, that's really good. Really good story. Um, okay, next question is, if you were 15 uh, years old now, would you what, would you do anything different? I know you mentioned about your, your diet. Yeah, and again, certainly, I, I, I remember I was, I was 15. I was playing for Nottingham Forest. Um, I was told around the Christmas time that I'd um, get an apprenticeship. So again, I, I, I thought I'd made it. I, I didn't revise in any of my, you know, um, English examinations or maths examinations, etc. You know, and then I started to, you know, get in trouble with the police. Forrest found out, and by the time April had come, you know, I got I got released to let me go. So, you know, just in the space of four months in, you know, in my head, I'd got my apprenticeship. You know, I let myself down badly, got in trouble with the police, thought I made it, you know, and ultimately got released. And, you know, it, it nearly all came crashing down because then I had to go on trial, you know, at two or three different clubs. Um, and then I got offered something by Aston Villa. And then the next day I broke my leg. So, you know, my career could have been over before it even started and, you know, to this day now, you know, uh, I regret all that. And like I say, at 15, it's just total dedication on, on football and your, you know, your education because football doesn't last forever, you know, mm. and even top players, you know, need another career, mm. whether it's in media or marketing and you'd always need your maths and English. So I would say, you know, you know, maths and English, vital. I get so many kids now who come through to me who haven't got the maths and English and they can't get the early levels they can't go to university and they have to come through me to, to get them so you know study hard train hard and, and dedicate your whole life to, to football yeah no that's a good advice again um so a question a question that sort of links a little bit because you mentioned about you breaking your leg is that the is that the worst injury you had as a as a footballer uh, I would say I'm lucky because I remember that I can remember it like yesterday. I remember I was I wasn't even 16 and I was an hospital in Birmingham. I remember the doctor putting the X-ray on the on the screen and saying, "Your career's over, son." And I just remember breaking down and crying. I broke both bones, my tib and my fib, and Aston Villa didn't even need to to take me on. And luckily they did. You know, I remember the physio saying to me after I came back, Jim Walker. He was saying, "We didn't think you." would come back from this you know if, if you're probably a little bit older you know you you know a lot of players during them that time obviously with technology and development of treatment of injuries he said you probably they wouldn't have come back yeah. from it um so to me i didn't know any difference so you know for yeah. me it was i was lucky i was so young but yeah i've done a cruciate ligament i've i've, I've um double hernias medial ligaments um uh, dislocated my shoulder Cut eyes. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, I probably probably my worst one was probably um, the double hernia for, for Peterborough because for some reason that just took me so long to to get over and you know, I still get paid now to, to this day. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, best moment at Posh. So we've said best moment in your career. So this is from Pisa. So it's the Independent Supporters Club. They they put a couple of questions. Through. So that was one of their one of theirs. One of my best moments for for Posh has to be. Um, I remember it. I think it was it was in December. It might have been the the week before Christmas, and we're playing John Beck's um, Lincoln City at, at home, and I think we might have been first. They might have been second or whatever. It was like a top of the table clash, and I always remember that they liked uh, some gamesmanship, brinksmanship. So anyway, I remember we, we came out for our warm up. Lincoln were already out warming up, but in our half of the field. So we're like, what's going on here? So um, we're like, what do we do? Do we do we do we bow down and go in the the half that we, we was like, no, we're going to warm up in the same half as we do. It was bizarre. So you had two teams warming up in in one half. It was it was it was laughable. It was it was funny. So I remember we were so wound up um, before the game. We ended up um, winning the game 5-1. I ended up scoring two in that game. I think Dave Farrell got two. I don't know who got the other one. And uh, But I always remember that I had a planned celebration if I scored. And it was like the 
the David plea uh, when he Luton stayed up and he had these um, uh, dodgy City, fur coat. Was it Man City? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Man City. And uh, his dodgy fur coat on and his arms were going up. And I remember yeah. doing that celebration and on the fancy <laughs> dress uh, that night, I'd actually had the David plea jacket. So that was, uh, I think we went top of the table. We won 5-1. And we had a great Christmas night out. So, yeah, that's probably my best moment. <laughs> Sounds brilliant. Um, which which club in your career stands out and why? This is from Richard Freak. Freak. He's from Pisa as well. Which club stands out the most? I mean, it, for me, it's got to be it's got to be Aston Villa, you know, just the way that obviously I started there. I broke my leg. I could have got released. They stuck by me. They rehabilitated me. You know, they give me my first team debut, you know, and I look back now and again when you have these moments when you, you're you at a Premier League club who just finished second in the in the first Premier League season to, to Man United and you get offered a two-year contract and you turn it down, you just think, who in the right mind would do that now? It just it just wouldn't happen. And, and bad advice and, you know, agents getting involved and, and money sidetracking you you know at the end of the day it's not about it's about money it's about playing as high as you can for as long as you can and the money will take care of itself but you know Aston Villa gave me a great foundation you know and I'll never be able to thank them enough. No that's, that's a fair comment. Um, so another one from Pisa is what attracted you to to Posh or was it something that was taken out of your hands? Is it something that did you have a choice? No or? I mean I mean to be honest I, I, I turned Posh down the, the year before because again that you know, I wanted to play as high as I could. Um, but in all honesty, you know, it was the the draw of, of Baz. I knew he had a team that he wanted to get promotion. Uh, and to be honest, you know, when you when you know, even way back then, when you looked at that new stand and, and the Posh's ground, it was it was it was still like a championship stadium, you know, and I and I didn't want to drop out of the championship leaving Stoke at the time. And I thought I was, you know, with Baz, we'd get, you know, Peter were back into the, the championship. But, I, you know, I think that season I joined with with injuries and a bad start, you know, and we ended up getting relegated and, and it, it turned out to be a disaster. But, you know, the draw of Baz and, the, and like you say, the, 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 the state of the ground um, and the ambition of the football club, that, that was the factor, yeah. Well, um... This one hasn't got a name, but they put, how did you rate your strike partnership with Jimmy Quinn? So you've obviously touched on it during the, the chat. Yeah, it would be a, a, a nine out of 10. Like I said to you, you know, when you've got a, a strike partnership like that, even when you're not scoring, you know, you can rely on somebody to get to get you goals. And when he's not scoring, I was getting goals. And like you say, in terms of, it would have been interesting, you know, back then if, if, if you had a, like they would they work out the assists for the strike pars and stuff and I, I'm sure that would have would have been high up there in terms of assisting each other as well. So it was a yeah, it would you know, be a nine out of ten. So do you think do you think it took the pressure off both of you that you knew that if one of you had a bad day, potentially the other one was going to score anyway. So it took, sort of took the pressure off because you have a lot of strikers that you know everybody's yeah. like the Harry Kane's of this world and. And the, the Ollie Watkins, if you're talking about Villa, are the, the main strikers. And if they don't score, who's going to score? But you, have, you know, there was two of you at the time who could potentially score. Oh, it's, it, it, it's huge, huge. And I, I remember, I'll, I'll go back to my time at, at Stoke. You know, I started my Stoke career on, on fire really well. But at the time, we had Mark Steen, Dave Regis. And um, I think in October, November, when I first signed... Uh, Steeny went to Chelsea for two and a half million quid. So then, you know, there was a lot of pressure on me as a, a 21 year old to, you know, replace the court cool hero, score the goals. And, you know, that, that pressure was, was relentless. Rejo ended up moving on and, you know, it, it was tough for me, you know, and it's, it's difficult when the crowd are on your back and you're getting chances, you're snatching it and your confidence goes and, you know, it, it's absolutely huge. And, and I remember, Franny Green talking about, you know, anxiety, you know, in his show. And it was clear to me that, you know, the anxiety that, that I had affected my ability to score goals and, and remain composed in those one-on-one -on -one situations. So, yeah, it was a big factor. And I, I don't know, like you say, if I'd have scored the, the chances that, that were created for me, then, you know, um, I would have been a cool hero at Stoke. Yeah, definitely. Do you think now then, touching on that, do you think now 
a lot of the bigger clubs bring in sort of specialised coaches. Do you think that is to help the strike? Say, if it was a of a strikers coach to to help just the mentality side of of playing in big games and and dealing with the pressure. Just just in terms of the, the mentality, you know, the, the the psychological side of it. You know, sitting with a psychologist. You know, under you know them understanding your anxieties, coping techniques. You know, how how do you deal with it? You know, obviously working on finishing training is brilliant, but you can be the best finisher in the world. But, you know, if you've got no confidence and you panic when you get that chance, then, you know, you're going to fluff your line. So, you know, like you say, they have the, they have the full package now to, to help support them. So, you know, I think that's why the, the quality of footballers has, has gone through the roof and they are as good as they are nowadays. Yeah, yeah no, definitely. Um, another question from Pisa is, uh, was... What was your biggest inf- who was your biggest influence in, in in your game? So maybe behind the scenes or I, I would have to go back to my old youth team coach um, Bobby Downs and, and a guy called Dave Richardson. You know they're the guys that, that took me to Villa. You know and uh, I've I've always kept in touch with a pair of them and even when I've I've uh, even when I left Villa, you know they've either phoned me or sent me letters and always offered words of encouragement and support so you know they they advised me from you know, the age of 15 you know and, and like i say i still speak to them now so they were absolutely massive and it's just such a you know great that, that people like that still take the time to to think about you even though you're, you're not involved with them anymore brilliant so the last question we've got um of, of the chat it, it is which player do you keep in contact in um or players uh, do you keep in contact since you've fin- since you finished playing professionally? Me, I, I keep in touch with loads. You know, I, um, oh God, who do I speak to? <laughs> to to him. most, I mean, the one from from Peterborough I speak to most is um, Roger 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 Willis, Harry Willis. He still lives in Nottingham, so I still right. speak to him. A um, uh, couple I still play with, Soldini. I, I'm lucky because I'm still involved with football, so I still quite. Still speak to quite a few. I speak. I still speak to, to Hoops. I still speak to Franny Green. Um, who else do I speak to from from Peterborough? I can't I can think of now. Um, Dennis Pierce. I'm in a posh posh um, WhatsApp group. So you've got oh, Jason wow. Lee. Uh, there's Tiles. There's uh, there's Gilly. So yeah, there's there's still quite a few we still speak to on a regular basis just via these these WhatsApp groups and stuff. So yeah, that's good. you know, there's a few, and it's difficult when people get families and yeah, you know, they move away, and you you've got a full time job. It's difficult to find that time. So for me, these WhatsApp groups are uh, uh, a, a different class because you still get that banter and yeah. you know and uh, that camaraderie even with players that you know you might not you know have a chance to speak to. No, brilliant. Well, Martin or Gandhi. Um, you know, I really appreciate really appreciate you know you giving it giving up your time to, to have a chat with you. It's been a really great insight to you know your your career and and you know a few really good stories there have come out. So we're going to put this on our uh, Sports Coffee um, YouTube channel. So it'll be out. I might actually, if I can get it sorted today, I might actually put it out today or over the weekend. Um, so we we'll put it out on social media um, and and get some and try and get some of your your ex your ex uh, colleagues to um, or teammates to to maybe retweet that over the over the weekend. Um, I'll get it in the posh watch WhatsApp it. group. Don't worry. <laughs> so um, no, like I say, it's been brilliant. I really appreciate your time. Um, so thanks to again to our sponsors, Insurewise, who obviously provided the questions as well today. Um, and again, Martin, all the best in your current career, and um, you know, we'll hopefully speak to you again sometime. All right, mate. Cheers. See you soon. Cheers. Thanks.